<laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine at E1. <laughs> no, he likes to do that. <laughs> I heard this one. Do <laughs> you want to put your hand in the water? Not that I'm excited about it, but... <laughs> Testing, one, two. When you press that one, it goes green, one, two. All right, so now it should work. Yep. All righty. Fantastic. Anything else? Are you okay? Just so everyone is aware, this is Listen Up Drupal, and it's confusing because the booklet says it would be in a different room. So there were some changes, but the website and downstairs on the screen, it's the actual thing.
wait a few more moments because maybe people downstairs are coming here because of the confusion. All right, I guess we will we'll get started then. Um, goedemiddag, or that's, that's how we say uh, good afternoon in Dutch. Um, listen up Drupal, it's basically a story about event subscribers. And um, these are the topics that I want to discuss. First, I want to introduce myself. I uh, want to share a little history of how I got to this session. Um, do some background information on the Symphony goodies that you can all work with. Uh, doing uh, my take on how to work with controllers and how I combine it to create uh, a new kind of do a new kind of API, API building in Drupal and if I got time I got some bonus content and of course I'll end with some conclusions um, so to start off who am I uh, I'm Robert and I'm a PHP developer at MediaMonks I'm not sure if anyone knows us um, but we are a global creative production partner, um, which basically means we can work with all the great brands in the world. And uh, we're with over 650 people in all over the world. And it's not just Drupal, it's basically everything digital, uh, from Drupal to VR to post-production. Um, and to go further with PHP, um, in 2006, which is a long time ago, I believe everyone had their own spaghetti framework who created their own framework at some point. We're PHP developers, so we like to reinvent the wheel, don't we? Um, then two years later, we started doing Zen Framework. Um, in 2012, we got Composer and Packages, with, which I think is one of the best things that happened to the PHP community. Um, a year later, we started doing Silex micro framework. It's also from the same guys that created Symfony. And in 2015, we started doing Symfony Framework. So I hear you thinking, there's no Drupal, and indeed, I don't do Drupal. Um, however, uh, we have a team doing Drupal uh, since a few years, and that's how I'm involved. Uh, other than that, next to being a developer, I'm also a daddy. Um, I'm a gamer, I'm a DJ, and I like my beers. And if anyone gets this joke, they know which game I'm playing. I see one, someone laughing. It's League of Legends. So my goals uh, are with this that I'm showing you is to create a scalable team. Um, we have some Drupal developers, but we also have a lot of Symfony developers, and it would be really nice to sometimes, if we have uh, a high demand for Drupal developers, that we would be able to have the Symfony developers join the Drupal guys and uh, be able to actually help out on the project. Um, combined strength, it's really nice to see discussions between the Symfony developers and the Drupal developers to see how things are done in Drupal and how things are done in Symfony. And I think we can learn a lot from each other there. Um, get people off their islands, and that's one of the reasons I'm doing this talk. I really would like to show you some new ideas that are totally not uh, common in Drupal. So please look beyond Drupalisms. And my ultimate goal would be to look uh, to make Drupal look like more like Symfony Framework. Um, so some viewer discretion is advised. Uh, I'll be showing some stuff that might be uh, really uncommon and some things that you, you might see are really stupid uh, when looking at it from a Drupal perspective. 
Um, please correct me afterwards if you see something really stupid. Um, but this is just my take on how I enjoy working with Drupal. Um, so a little history. Um, at the company, we work with a lot of different backend languages, and all of them have their different frameworks. Obviously, there's PHP, but there's Ruby, uh, .NET, Node, Python, and we also have a lot of different frontends to work with. Obviously, there's JavaScript. Uh, we have iOS developers. We have Android developers. We have Unity developers, and I'm still listing it. Flash. It's of course that, but this is a big part of our company for many years. Um, so APIs were really messy. Um, we had XML. We did AMP, which is an Adobe message format. It's, it's ugly. Um, and now we use a lot of JSON or message back. Um, and we also had the discussions about data, how we handle status codes and error handling and pagination, what would happen with form handling. So we decided to come up with our own standard. I think this is pretty common. Um, but uh, it worked really well, and we sat together with all the department leads. We created our own API spec, and everyone uh, joining the company needs to read the spec, or only developers, obviously. Um, and we, all the frameworks that we create are making sure that this spec is uh, being used. If you like, you can read it, but it's, it doesn't really matter for you. Um, so to make it easier for PHP developers, I created an event subscriber for Silex which is the micro framework we were working with back then. And basically, it allows you to return anything from a controller. Um, like in Drupal, you can also return a response, a symphony response object, and you can return an array uh, to render a view. Um, but I wanted to also return objects and such, and also be able to throw exceptions anywhere. And uh, then it would convert it into the API spec. Uh, this event subscriber was a single file, there were no tests or anything, so it was full of bugs, but still, it worked pretty well. Um, eventually, I ported this to a Symfony framework bundle, and it was no longer a single file. Uh, it's customizable, it's tested, and if you like, you can find it on GitHub. Um, this is also the point that I started doing unit tests. Um, it's really good. You should, if you're not doing it yet, please do it, because it will really improve your code. Um, so to show some code, um, this is how a controller would look like. It's really simple. You can return, in this case, an integer or a string, and it would, in this case, just convert it into what we believe is, our, is the right spec for our company. Um, you can also return an array, or you can set your custom status codes, or use any custom headers, just return any response that you like. And um, it would automatically convert exceptions into the errors that we've defined. Uh, so you see code error matches foo, which is the thing I passed in the exception. Um, and it would also recognize uh, Symfony HTTP exceptions. So you can just throw a 404 exception, basically not found, and it would automatically convert that into the right status or the right error code. Um, this is something I'm getting back to later in the session. But with Symfony form, you can just pass the entire form to the exception, and it would automatically um, give you all the errors of the form or the validation errors that you uh, got back. So it's, it's really easy for front-end to process this. Um, so profit, is, this, is, this is a lot easier for us to work with, and it saves a lot of time to not redo this in any, every project. Um, but what about Drupal? Um, because that's what I'm here for. So a little background on the Symfony goodies first to get a better understanding of how it works. Um, this is a phrase that I've heard a lot in the past few years. Drupal 8 is using Symfony framework, uh, which is actually um, wrong because um, it's actually, Symfony is a set of reusable components and there are currently around 50. Um, and next to that, it's also a framework. So there's the Symfony components and the Symfony framework, which are two different things. Um, so they're not the same. And in Symfony, we have bundles. And in Drupal, you have modules. And basically, it's the exact same idea. It's just packing, uh, combining a bunch of code. You define your routes. You can define services. But 
Unfortunately, they're not compatible, but it will give you an idea. Um, so what components does Drupal 8 actually use? Uh, the most important ones are HTTP kernel, which consists of HTTP foundation and event dispatcher. It uses the routing component, dependency injection and YAML, and a few other which are less important right now. So what the HTTP kernel does, and this is basically, I'm pretty sure that most of you opened the index.php uh, at some point, it basically, what it does, it, it converts your request, and it could be from a web server or a unit test, um, and it converts it into a response that will get sent back to the user. And uh, if you open your index.php, this is basically what you will see. Um, you can hook into this kernel with, uh, with event subscribers, and that's basically what Drupal is already doing. It's defining basically on the, on the request that's getting in. It's defining which controller to load, which will do its thing and return, um, return a, a response. Um, it's a powerful way to, to change behavior. So what kernel events uh, are there actually? Uh, so these are the actual Symfony uh, um, kernel events. There's kernel request, uh, and you can use it to add more information, uh, check something in the request, like if there's some kind of parameter. Uh, that's also a moment where you could maybe fetch something from cache and directly uh, return it, because if you, can, uh, if you are able to set a response in this event subscriber, it will return automatically and it will skip all the rest that it otherwise would have done. Kernel controller, uh, this allows uh, setting or updating uh, the controller that will be called. And you can also use it to, uh, to pre-initialize some other services maybe. Kernel.view, uh, this will actually transform a non-response object uh, response into a symphony response. So this is also, this is also what, uh, what is happening in Drupal when you return an array with views. It will use this event to transform it into uh, HTML. Uh, kernel response, you can use it to add some headers, store it in cache, inject content, or serialize it maybe as JSON or, or a message back, something like that. <coughs> there's kernel exception, well, I think it's obvious. Uh, this will get triggered when there's an exception and you can hook into it and convert it into any kind of response that you'd like. Uh, and this is not used often, uh, kernel terminate. Uh, you can use this whenever you are using um, some kind of email layer, an email tool. You can put the email in and um, when the request is sent already back to the user, you can send out the actual email when um, the, the process is still running on your web server. So the user will have a smooth experience while the heavy work is still done on your web server. This is only working with PHP FPM, so it's good to know. Um, how do you create an event subscriber? It's really easy. You basically create your own class. You implement the event subscriber interface from Symfony. And the only um, requirement is that you, uh, part of the interface is that you have a, func a function called get subscribed events. There you define all the events that you would like to listen to. You point it to a method and then do your thing. So in this case, I'm setting a custom header uh, saying Drupal loves Symfony. And uh, if for some reason you would like to change the priority, because sometimes it can really matter much uh, which uh, event subscriber is called uh, before the other one, you can set the priority to make sure that yours gets run first, or if it doesn't really matter, you can have it a really low priority. So that's what it's useful for. Um, then you need to register the service in your services YAML file, which I think everyone will know how to do. Um, so you can do it like this. The most important thing here is to see that there's a tag called event subscriber, and then it will get hooked into the system. Um, I would consider this, this the old way of doing it, um, and this would be the new way, uh, which is uh, a feature from uh, Symfony 3.3 uh, actually. And uh, luckily, Drupal 8.5 now uses Symfony 3.4. So this is actually something you can do. It's now a new thing to uh, recommend it that you use your fully qualified class name as the name of the service instead of making up a name. And then you can omit the class uh, and it will, use, it will assume the class name is this. It's the, the name of the service. 
so it's, it's, it's shorter, it saves you typing. And it also has some other advantages, but I'll show you later. Um, so in this case, I'm not sure if you can actually see it, uh, but this is response and the last line, it will, sh it will say a custom header, which says Drupal Love Symphony. So really easy to do. So getting back to the, the bundle I showed before, um, this library only relied on HTTP kernel. And so I decided to split uh, the Symfony framework bundle into a framework agnostic package. And then I would implement only the part in Symfony to glue it together. Um, so I was really curious, would it actually work in Drupal? So actually, yes, it did. I created a custom module with two YAML files and it simply did the trick. Um, well, I, I think everyone knows the info YAML um, and the services YAML. And I think the top thing is, is most important. I create the event subscriber and also a new thing that you can use all the code examples are assuming you're on 8.5 because it's cool. Um, I'm using auto wiring so it would automatically fetch the right service from the container. Um, so it just saves you a lot of, a lot of configuration. So there are some few more services that I, that I needed, but uh, obviously they didn't fit on the screen. So after that, I created a controller in Drupal. I created my action, I called it, and it actually worked. And this was pretty much my reaction because I thought it was really exciting that I could do something from my Symfony knowledge in Drupal and it would actually, um, and it would actually work. So then I decided to uh, take it a step further and uh, also uh, implement uh, the way how I like to work with controllers. And the way I like to work with controllers is to use them as a service. And I'm not sure if anyone knows how to use it, uh, but most people have, uh, have no idea that, it, that it's, it's a thing. What it means is that your uh, controller doesn't implement uh, or doesn't extend the controller base, which, you, which is provided by Drupal. And you would only inject the services that you, need, that you actually need. Um, and this is coming from the documentation from uh, Drupal itself. Document uh, dependency injection is the preferred method for accessing and using services in Drupal 8. It should be used whenever possible. So please stop doing this everywhere. I'm, I'm seeing it a lot also in core. Don't do it because if you are typing this, it means that probably you should be using dependency injection instead. The advantage of using controllers and services is that you can do everything with configuration, with dependency injection, um, and I think it's easier to do replacements of services or do refactoring by doing that. Uh, it's easy to see in your controller what's actually available, and it helps preventing uh, getting fat controllers because you should have small controllers uh, or slim controllers, how you want to call it. Um, obviously, there are also disadvantages. Uh, because you need to create your own helper functions, like if you want to render something or you, you, you know those helper functions better than I do. Um, but you would have to create them all yourself. So in the end, you will probably have your own abstract controller where you define those helper functions. Uh, a controller is not, use, uh, not usable most of the times anyway. So why bother creating it a service? And it takes more time to configure. But this will uh, improve a lot when using Drupal 8.5. So how to do it? Um, this is, when I was looking at it, uh, this was the, the way that I found in documentation by implementing the, uh, the container injection interface. And you would have to create a, uh, a create function that would get stuff from the container and uh, have to construct in there. So, but now, there's still a create function there that, that's tied to the framework that you're using and there's, so I'm not really happy with it. So you can also do it without create and then it would look like this, which is really clean. It's not tied to Drupal at all. You can just would be able to take this controller, put it in another uh, framework using um, HTTP kernel and you would be fine. Um, you can register it like this. So it's just a service like any other. And if you're using the auto wiring, um, I'm using a word generator as an example now. Um, it would auto wire it, so that makes it really easy to auto configure any, uh, all of this. And as you can see, uh, I wanted to show an example on why it's helpful to use the, the class name instead of the name of the service. 
as you can see here, um, return new static, and from the container you would uh, get, uh, you would use the, the class name of the um, of the service instead of having the 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 name that you came up with to while defining the service. I think this is a lot more readable. Um, then you need to set up routing. Yes. I think we could probably spend another session spe specifically on that. But what it does is, um, let's go to this one. Uh, in your construct, I'm requiring now the, the word generator. And um, okay. yeah. here I'm defining the word gener generator. Yes, yeah, it clear? All right. And so it would automatically figure out that this is the required service and it would inject it. So this saves you from setting the, ar the arguments manually, basically. Um, so uh, setting up the routing, uh, it's fairly easy. You just define your path and you set your controller and uh, you use the, the name of the service, which is now the name of the, of the class. Uh, set the action and you're good to go. Um, while I was looking into this, it was undocumented. So obviously I did the thing that was right and I added it to the documentation. So you can, you can find it there. Um, then I think the most, uh, let's look at the time, just to be sure, all right. Um, controller annotations, this is something I believe is fairly uh, unknown in Drupal. Uh, in Symfony we use it all the time and it's coming from a, uh, a bundle called the extra bundle. And it's not delivered uh, by default in Symfony, but a lot of Symfony developers are actually using it. And it allows you to create controllers by using simply, simply uh, setting annotations. So you can define your route, uh, what method it might be restricted to, uh, if there's parameter converters or what template it's rendering, security, cache. So this is basically the full blown example of what uh, the extra bundle can do. And basically it saves you from going to your routing file and defining everything there. It, it can save you a lot of time. Um, so can we do this in Drupal? Uh, which was one of the first thing I was looking at uh, while trying stuff. Uh, nope, you cannot do this in Drupal. Uh, but uh, it's uh, based on uh, event subscribers. So I was thinking we should be able to do this. And that's when I started or decided to port this to Drupal. And uh, this is how it looks. As you can see, it looks nearly the same as in Symfony framework. Uh, so you can define your route, um, you can set your method. Uh, a few things are different though, because the security in, in Drupal is different from Symfony's. Um, so I've ported that to make sure that it's the same. And um, this is how you can register the annotations from, for the routing. Uh, you can, with paths, you can give it a prefix. Like if you're creating an API, you don't have to put slash API in every controller, which is annoying. And set the annotation type and set the name of the module, and it would pick it up. So you would be able to create a, a controller with these endpoints slash examples, in this case it would be API examples, and have a get method for it and have a post method for it. So that's really easy to work with. Um, you can set all the kinds of security that you know, so you can use role, access, uh, CSRF, you can make sure uh, something is marked as admin, you can uh, give, uh, you can set it to render a template, uh, which I believe this is the correct way of defining a, a module or, or a template uh, name. So feel free to correct me if it's wrong. I'll put the slides online so you can later bug me uh, somewhere to make sure that I do it the right way. Um, you can set cache uh, in a lot of ways because um, this is all parsed by Symfony, so it's it's really easy. Uh, param converter, and please note that this is actually a different param converter than the one that's already in Drupal. There are different namespaces, so this is the one from Symfony. Um, but this way you can uh, make sure that you, when you get, have to show action, that there's actually a article node provided before getting into the, uh, getting into the controller in action. So in the, in the parameter converter itself, if no uh, article is found with this ID, you can directly make sure that it throws a not found exception. Uh, this also is supported uh, by default. Uh, it supports dates, so you can have any date format in there that you'd like. And also you could create your own, but just uh, 
creating or uh, implementing the interface, you can have an apply to do anything that you want and support checks if the object or the thing that's passed to the controller, if it supports this kind of parameter conversion. So it's really flexible. Um, I also wanted to port PSR7 support, which is something that is in the, fr the framework extra bundle. And while doing this, I uh, found out that it's already supported uh, by core, so I didn't need to port this, but it's just cool to know that this is actually a possibility in Drupal. So how does this actually work? Um, it's nothing more than acting on certain events, and um, it modifies the request and, and, and response objects to, um, to do the actual rendering and make sure that everything gets, uh, gets done that needs to be done, like for instance, setting the security. Um, for the routing, it uses the route, uh, routing route dynamic event, which is something specifically from Drupal. Uh, but after all the routes are um, taken care of, it will add the routes that were found with annotations. Um, development process was kind of messy. Uh, first, I required the extra bundle from Symfony, and that, that worked. Uh, I created a custom module. I registered all the event subscribers that were in the, in the framework bundle or in the extra bundle, I would fail. It wouldn't work at all. Uh, and mostly this was because of uh, the priorities, uh, because Drupal already has a set of event subscribers and uh, they were basically conflicting. So I needed to make sure that the event subscribers from, uh, from my new module were actually uh, being done earlier than the ones from Drupal. And a lot of, there were a lot of incompatibility, uh, incompatibilities and um, for example, a security, um, and I need to redo it entirely, and eventually I decided to remove the framework extra bundle entirely and um, make it a separate module which was self-containing without any extra uh, Symfony uh, requirements. Um, so it worked, uh, and I was really excited by it, and, and you can actually try it yourself. Uh, I created a module uh, from it, and um, uh, it's good to, good to know that I know that Eric is sitting there. Uh, he reviewed it, um, uh, and security-wise, I, I think we think it's all good, but it will never get a security badge because it's following PSR standards. Uh, sorry. Um, and it's also primarily hosted on GitHub, and it's using Travis CI to do automated builds on multiple versions of PHP and Drupal, which is, I think, something that's really fun to do. Um, so it should be compatible, but there's no security badge. Um, so using all of this, I think it's nice to be able to create an actual API with this. Um, Content-wise, I really like working with Fractal. Uh, not sure if anyone heard of it, uh, but it's, it's a library uh, to convert any object into an array. And... Um, it's, it's really nice. It, it looks like this, a transformer. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm uh, getting a node object, which I'm assuming now is an article, because there's no type hinting for, uh, at least that I'm aware of, for nodes. So you might would, would like to check here if it's, actual, if it's an actual article. Um, but then you return, uh, return an array, and this is something that will be outputted by your API. And the nice thing is that you can use it to, for a, a single entity or single node. Uh, all the code, is, it looks like this. You have your fractal manager. You define your transformer, which is the article transformer. And in this case, you're saying resource item because it's just one. And with create data, it will convert everything to, to an array. Um, you can also do this with, with a collection, multiple entities. Uh, you would just use a different one. You would use the, the resource collection pass the array of entities that you have, and it will run them for every entity. It also supports includes. So if you have, in this case, an article, you might want to optionally include the author, and uh, you would have a, a, separate, um, a separate transformer just for authors. And that way you can really create structure in how things are converted. Um, so to enable these includes, you would potentially use a get parameter, or you would do it by code. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to, to activate all of this. Be aware, though, of lazy loading. Um, I think everyone working with lazy loading, or I think Drupal does it too. I used to work with Doctrine, uh, ORM. It's really a pitfall. 
because if you're doing this, it will uh, lazy load every entity, and that will mean a separate call to your database for each entity. So that could really make things slow. So make sure to find a optimized way for loading entities first before you're actually starting to convert the entities. Just try it. Um, it's not a Drupal thing, uh, but the thing I want to show is that you can use uh, any PHP package in Drupal because it's all PHP. You can just use what is there, what's available. So forms, um, I, I, I hate to work with forms, and I think most of us do. It's, it's usually very boring. Um, but uh, Symfony uh, form eases the pain, I believe. Uh, there's a great, great builder. It's highly customizable, and it includes validation. And the beauty is it also can be used in Drupal without any issues. You can just use Composer to require all of it and just start using it. It doesn't Because it's Drupal, it doesn't mean you have to use the Drupal form API. Uh, so a simplified example of how a form would be built is uh, you add a title and it would be a text type. Uh, you would have constraints, it can't, be, it can't be empty, and there is a minimum and a maximum length. And um, I think it's, it's very clean because it's all code. It, it's not huge arrays, but it's just it's code that you can actually read. Um, so an implementation in, in Drupal could look like this. Again, this is just how I think by looking at the documentation, how I can do it. If everything in my form is, uh, is, uh, is validated and it's valid, um, I can just use this to create a new node and uh, I'm sure that then everything is valid. Um, and I would return my response saying, create it. Um, you can also use Twig to render these forms. Um, it's, it's basically the same as in APIs. Uh, there's an, a handle request method on your form and it will take care of all the errors and stuff, and it will it will all push it to uh, to a form uh, object, which you can pass to to Twig. And in Twig, these are the only lines that you would have to use for a default form being rendered. Uh, so this is very easy, and uh, it's really extendable because you can, for any type of form or header or whatever, you can override the Twig template, so it can look exactly how you want it to be. Um, there are four types for, for every need. I'm just listing a few, but there's tons of them. You can, you can look them up in the, in the Symfony documentation. And the same thing with validators. There are so many. You can, you can also create your own. Um, it's, it's really easy to work with. Um, so try it sometime. Uh, it's really well documented. Uh, I wouldn't say the form component is the easiest. I'm uh, actually thinking that form is, is maybe the hardest component in Symfony next to the security component. But if you are getting, um, uh, if you're using it more and more, you'll feel better at using it and, and you, you'll be really confident and it, it will save you loads of time. So putting it all together, uh, 45 minutes is short to show it all, but I created a, a, an example API module, uh, which combines all the things that you've seen in this session. So it combines using form and the controller annotations, um, uh, just the way how I like it with auto wiring, so it does require Drupal 8.5 and uh, PHP 7.1. But I think it's just a nice example of, of what could be done with Drupal. Oh, we're taking a picture. Yeah, all right. Um, all right, let's see if there's time. Yeah, we do. Uh, so, so a few bonus things. Um, another really practical use of, of, of event subscribers. It's uh, using uh, pre-render, um, and it's, it's a thing we use for, uh, for CO, um, because we've been working decoupled for, for quite a few years at, at MediaMonks, and um, um, it's, it's always a big thing, to, because you would miss your CO, you would have a beautiful front end, but it wouldn't be optimized for search engines. Um, why are we doing why are we doing uh, decoupled? Is because we have uh, a really we are really big, so we have the luxury of having uh, 40 front end developers being split into templators and scripters, and we would have different back end uh, teams. So, like I showed, we have Python teams, and so they can really do their own thing in front end that they would like to work with. They have their own frameworks, and we shouldn't be touching that. Um, so basically, scalability, they can do whatever they like. We can implement it how we want. Um, they also need creative freedom. Uh, we're really focused on creating beautiful experiences. So 
you would need page transitions and stuff. We have projects which are using uh, WebGL, and it's something you cannot do with refreshes and such. So the CEO part, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's annoying. Uh, and there are luckily a few solutions. Uh, you can decide to ignore it completely. Sometimes you actually don't need CEO. It could be a, a short-living campaign. Uh, you can assume everyone uses Google because Google actually knows how to work with front-end frameworks. Um, you could duplicate routing in back-end. Um, so when, I'm, when someone refreshes the page, uh, you would actually render the piece of content uh, in, in, in a non-beautiful way and JavaScript will just take it over. Or you could use something like pre-render or PhantomJS, which uh, is a headless browser, which you can send a request to. It will get the page, render all the JavaScript, and uh, you would be able to do with it whatever you like. So a common implementation for this is to have a request, uh, detect if it's a bot based on their user agent, and then send it to pre-render, and then give it back whatever pre-render sent, uh, sent back. Uh, our implementation is slightly different because we're usually uh, behind a, a CDN. Um, so we don't actually have access to the user's user agent because it's handled by the CDN. So what we did was crawl our own website with, uh, with a tool. Uh, then every uh, URL that we found, we sent it to the pre-render service. Uh, we store the results in the database. And whenever a request comes in, we just try to match it with something that we already crawled or crawled before. And if we found something, we basically inject the content in the page that was crawled before. And that works really, really well. Uh, so for this, we created a crawler. It's using generators. Uh, so to keep, because the first version didn't have it and it would always run out of memory. So we, were, um, we updated it using generators and now the memory will always remain low. It's highly customizable. You can use whitelisting or blacklisting of URLs. You can do normalization. So if you want to strip out certain get parameters, for instance, you can do that. So this would be a, a example, like crawling our own website. It would just be a loop, uh, and you would get any page back and do with it whatever you like. Um, so for instance, you could get the title of the page, or you could get the meta description, or uh, get some content from a certain div and uh, just store it in your database, and you're done. Um, you wouldn't be crawling your, your admin or your search pages, so you can exclude those. Uh, it's really easy, or use the whitelist to only make sure that you crawl specific pages. How you would be able to do this, uh, implement this into Drupal, you would maybe with Drupal console create a command for it, uh, have an event subscriber doing the, the request, uh, detecting the request and just return a response if it was found. And by keeping it up to date, you can use different things. You can do timed, like do it every day, or you can have some CMS trigger, like whenever this piece of content was updated, make sure that the URL gets crawled again into put it in some queue. Um, we also have a website with users priorities, uh, because some pages change a lot, some don't. So whenever a page is changed, it would increase the, the priority, and that way it would automatically sort itself out. Uh, and another big benefit is that you would have a full site search because you have every page on, in your in your site. Uh, if it's auto generated or not, if it if it actually contains content from front end, like maybe there's JSON files from front end implementing content, you would have it all combined together, and you you would have a uh, you could put it in Elasticsearch, and it's really easy to uh, to have a a search with that. Um, also, you can give it a try. You can also, if you want to do this in Drupal, you can probably look at the Symfony uh, bundle because it already has a uh, console command, which is the same as how Drupal console is doing it. So if you're interested, just take a look at it. Uh, more, I do have a few, few things. Development made easier. Um, yeah, five minutes, all right. Um, development made easier working with um, um, Drupal was very hard for me because it would have all the caches and you would constantly have to clear cache or go or use Drush uh, to clear the cache or something. And uh, the things I'll be showing, never use them in production, please. Don't blame me if you, for some reason, do it at some point. Uh, I've warned you. Um, this is a really simple way, using event subscribers once more, to just disable route cache. So whenever requests that come in, you would first rebuild the cache 
And then whenever you are adding some kind of controller or some endpoint, you don't need to manually do the cache clear. It, it saves me a lot of time. And also uh, disable container dumping. Like when working with services, it's really annoying to, again, to clear the cache all the time. And uh, actually the third parameter, uh, it was some, it was really easy to do it, but I first needed to figure out how. Uh, the third parameter in your Drupal kernels actually allow dumping. And if you set it to false, it will stop dumping the container. So whenever you add a service, it's there on the next refresh. So that, that's really, really easy to use. And um, if you're working with services or routes, um, use Drupal console, uh, use the debug options to search for specific services or routes. It's, it's really easy. Um, so too long didn't listen. Um, event subscribers are awesome. I think it's really powerful and Drupal is built on it, but you can leverage them to, to make it even better. Uh, Symphony knowledge is really useful if you want to work on Drupal and uh, it would allow me to help out on a Drupal project with even, without even knowing how to do anything with Drupal because I have no clue how to build a content website with Drupal really. Um, there's more than Drupal.org people. Uh, there's tons of packages on packages and it's PHP, so it's actually things that you can use. It doesn't have to be a module uh, to, to be used. Uh, we can really learn from each other's solutions. Um, I think it's really fun to see because we have a Symfony team and a Drupal team and how we can look at each other and, and discuss like how's Drupal doing this, how is it saving its content and we're using this and we are actually looking for a way to uh, copy how Drupal is storing its content to use it in Symfony framework. So I think that's, that's really exciting. Please, I'm not sure if anyone is not using it, please use Composer. Uh, it makes it so easy to do all of this stuff. And in the end, it's, it's all PHP, so it's easy. Thanks for your attention. Um, are there any questions? I shall repeat the, the question. Uh, uh, does it result in technical debt for only a few people knowing, like you mean what's going on that maybe Drupal developers don't know what's going on in there? Um, that, that might be a risk, that's a good point. Um, but I think the concepts are pretty easy and when you would open up a controller, it, I think it's really obvious without knowing how it works. Um, I think it's pretty easy to copy and paste it into, into improving it or changing the behavior. So I, I don't think it will lead to actual problems. Uh, but like I said, it's, it's my idea on this. And I'm not saying you should be using it or doing, starting with this right away. Uh, but it, it, it could be an option. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, um, if I'm saying it correctly, please, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the question is that um, uh, would I rather see people move from Drupal to Symfony to have the same, basically the same way of working? Uh, yeah, I would love that a lot. Uh, and I think, um, I th I'm, I'm really convinced that, that Drupal could have been built as a set of, of Symfony bundles rather than, than copying uh, a lot of other stuff. So uh, I would really like to see the direction where Drupal would use more and more components of Symfony um, uh, instead, like config, which I know is also highly debated. Um, and I would really like to see that Drupal would switch to PSRs more, uh, especially coding style. Um, is it gonna happen soon? Probably not. Uh, but would I like to see it? Yeah, very much. And I think it will, um, there were these islands and I think uh, we're building bridges now, but it would be really great if, if we would actually be on the same island or just create one piece of land. Um, and I hope that this will contribute to make that happen.
and we're done. All right. You can find the slides there. Um, if you're Dutch, it, you know it's a funny name, but there's a few Dutchies out here. Um, thanks a lot again for your attention. Yeah, I can believe that. Yeah, yeah, it's a big change. Yeah, I can imagine it's difficult, and and what I think is uh, not helping. Um, but I, I think we need the documentation of the site down at the moment. It could be way more. I think it could be way more structured. And um, I can I can recommend to check out the Jinping documentation um, because I believe it's one of the best documentations for open source projects out there. And uh, it, it, there are really much examples of how to use dependency injection and routing. And most of the things are, are like I said, the new components are uh, implemented exactly uh, how it's on the documentation. So yeah, so that, that will help a lot. Yeah, it's great. Welcome. I'm just wondering. Yeah. If you have to use uh, Kruger, you just use uh, native ones. You don't have to change much of anything. Regarding that form, uh, yeah. well, um, we aren't using it this much yet. Okay. At least, uh, well, I would say conceptual, but it, it actually works, so that, that's nice. Uh, but I'm pushing the team, like, like if you need to do something with forms, in an API, especially in an API, try to use this. And and the funny thing is that uh, the Drupal team yeah. really loves it, yeah. uh, but sometimes there's a lot of pressure on the project and then they just fall back to what they know, mm. which I can't blame them for. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to push the concept a little bit. Yeah. We, have, we have a quite a big company team, so yeah. if they have any questions, they can always ask. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> At least one of the people. I was afraid that I wouldn't, but uh, I think I've told a lot. If you know me, that I usually I usually talk a lot. Would you like to do this in a group of young kids? Uh, uh, if I get selected, I did enter the same night. You, you too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I intended to do it last year and they didn't. So oh, okay. Okay. But it was because they didn't know me. <laughs> okay. And now they do. And now they do, hopefully. So yeah, well, uh, you've <laughs> invested some <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and maybe uh, uh, Drupal Europe would be really nice, yeah. mm -hmm. which yeah. is coming up. So, uh, yeah. I'm excited about sharing the story. So, uh, I, w I would I would suggest doing less. Yeah, you think? Uh, I could. I could. Follow it mostly because I studied the module, but yeah. I don't know about the rest whether they could follow up till mm -hmm. the end. Yeah, yeah, so that's why I put uh, like I did the session before at uh, Drupal uh, Tech Talk. Yeah, uh, I think it was there. Yeah, um, and then I was actually browsing code during the during the presentation. Uh, I, I think the the the, for the format is good, mm -hmm. but I think the code examples take the 
more time for people to mm -hmm. to consume and maybe to to add new knowledge, you know.